the competitive 40k network presents art of war strategy and tactics discussions with the best players on the planet and now your host tim penny and the art of war coaches Hello and welcome to the Art of War 40K, your podcast for high-level strategy and tactics and detailed list breakdown from the top players around the world. I'm your host, Tim Penny, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host, John Lennon. For those of you new to the show, uh, John is one of the Art of War coaches. Uh, he has been a uh, household name in the competitive scene for a while. Some of his recent accomplishments are the uh, the winner of the uh, Dallas Open, Lone Star Open, and the uh, Charity Hammer Invitational GT. I think, John, you actually uh, recently, I, I believe you were number two for the GWGT, which we're going to be talking about today. Uh, how you doing, John? Is that right or no? That, that is correct. Uh, I did receive a reward, or an award, I should say, called second to one at that event. Um, so second place, not too shabby. Uh, however, the man that I came second to, unfortunately, is uh, right next to me right now. And we have Mr. Richard Siegler joining us today. Great to be here. Um, I actually played both of you at the tournament, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> we get to talk <laughs> that, about that sisters, is a lot of Adam fun. Yep. <laughs> that's probably the first time that's ever happened on the Art of War podcast, where somebody uh, got to play both hosts. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. and you took us both down. And took them both down. Yeah, it took us both down. Well, we can we can just skip over over that part real quick. But how how you doing, man, Richard? Besides, uh, well, I think I saw you uh, twice in the uh, the past three weeks. You're looking uh, healthy and good both times. But uh, how things been going with you? Excellent. Uh, you know, the weekend was a little tiring, eight rounds, um, but uh, I'm kind of used to the big events. I really enjoyed being on stream again, but uh, yeah, I did not get the, the best of sleep. I was sleeping on uh, Mr. Jack Harpster's couch in the hotel room, so <laughs> not the best night of sleep, but uh, overall, I was very prepared for this tournament, and I brought the list that I thought would uh, do the best, and turned out, did the job. Yeah, and uh, John, I feel like I've just practically been living with you for the past uh, three weeks. But uh, how you been doing? This couple times where I haven't seen you. Uh, doing great. Uh, you know, we're coming, we're coming back with this episode right after both Charity Hammer and, uh, of course, the GW Open, and then we had a little practice weekend before that. So it's uh, good to catch up with you, Tim, the past couple weeks, and uh, it's also good to be back home and uh, be recording podcasts again. Heck yeah! And uh, definitely got a couple uh, good nights of sleep. So let's uh, kick this episode off. Uh, Richard, why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, about what your list, I mean, you, some of the more astute listeners might know, but uh, we haven't even really revealed the secret of what faction you're playing. So why don't you go ahead and tell us about the faction, sub-faction, just run down the list, top to bottom. I was blessed by the Omnisai himself to run the Adeptus Mechanicus to this tournament. Um, I ran a single battalion of Metallica, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in a, just a second, but uh, I was made fun of for trying out a lot of the Forge Worlds and not just playing Lucius after Lucius after Lucius build, but uh, I ended up going with Metallica for this event, and I played single battalion because I wanted to access um, as many CP as possible for my Skatari veteran cohort, which is an army of renown that Admech got access to in the Book of Fire, and I decided to run it here, um, and we'll talk about why in just a bit. Uh, I went with uh, four characters. One is uh, the Techno Archaeologist, and he took advantage of the Brotherhood of the Cog rule to fit in this single battalion. He was equipped with a, a variety of things, uh, starting with the Metallic and Lung, a specific relic to reroll wounds in a 3-inch aura, and then he also had the Ash Runner trait for plus 3-inch move and plus 1 strength and attacks, and then he had the Holy Order trait for Genitors. Uh, so I pick a unit in my command phase, and that unit gets 6s uh, to hit and melee are automatically wounded. Um, and then I had two Skatari Marshals, one of which was loaded up with the Kenic Thrallnet, the specific relic for the Skatari Veteran Cohort, and then the Warlord trait Calculate Without Diversion, uh, which is also from the Veteran Cohort. And then he was backed up by a second Marshal, who had the Exemplar's Eternity for reroll hits of one and wounds of one, so I didn't have to take a Dominus. And then he had the Warlord trait Eyes of the Omnissiah to give a unit in my command phase reroll advances and charges. And then finally, the last character was the Tech Priest Manipulus, and he didn't have any special things, just the Holy Order trait Logi which allows me to pick a unit to ignore AP 1 and 2, and that's both in shooting and combat. I uh, could have upgraded that to uh, ignore cover, but uh, I never did. I just kept ignore AP 1 and 2 because it's such an amazing rule. Then I had six troop units, five rangers, five rangers, five rangers, then 19 rangers with the omni specs to ignore cover, and then five vanguard, five vanguard. Uh, these are all veterans. They had to be because they are this Qatari veteran cohort, so I had to pay extra points for them. 
but with that, they got the five up invuln as well as plus one attack and plus one leadership, as well as the vanguard. You couldn't blast them, but I didn't take big vanguard, so that didn't matter. And then the rangers, if they didn't make a normal move, fall back, etc., um, in my in my movement phase, then they counted as in light cover. Then I had uh, six elite choices. Five infiltrators with taser goads, five infiltrators with taser goads, eight infiltrators with the stud carbine and the flechette, uh, or the, uh, the the power sword, and then uh, three Sakaran units, all with the transonic blades. It uh, was eight, eight, and then ten. And the ten man unit, I paid a CP to give the princeps a uh, fight last relic called the Tempercopia. So at the start of the fight phase, I choose a unit within three, and that unit fights last. Really powerful in the melee mirror matchups. Then I had uh, three fast attack choices. One was nine uh, Taraxi Sterilizers. Then two units of Zebras Raiders. One was nine with the Enhanced Data Tether. And then finally, a seven with the Enhanced Data Tether. And the last unit was a Scorpius Dune Rider, the uh, Skatari Transport. And that was the list. All right. Um, yeah, that was quite a lot. And I think the first thing that will really stick out um, to the more eagle, eagle-eared listeners is... Uh, no, no Iron Strider uh, Balistari, no chickens. Um, we'll get, we can probably get into this in a little more detail, but um, not to jump ahead, talk us through the basic strategy and uh, premise of the list. Uh, and then uh, as we kind of figure out like what type of list this is from just top-down view, we'll start getting into some more of the interesting uh, unit choices that you chose. Yeah, so you mentioned Iron Strider. The FAQ was in effect for Games Workshop Orlando, so Iron Striders did not have the core keyword um, acquisition at any cost was changed to uh, cost um, being only once per game, and you had to be wholly within range of an objective, etc. So the main changes in the AdMech uh, FAQ update were in effect here, so I had to take those into consideration. The biggest thing for me going into Games Workshop Orlando was practicing on the actual terrain format, and for those who aren't familiar, it was four large ruins in which the first floor completely blocked line of sight. So all the doors and windows that you would normally have in a lot of uh, large ruin formations, they were either blocked up or didn't exist on the Games Workshop terrain, which meant you could be in light cover inside the terrain feature and not be shot very easily. Um, in fact, the holes in the terrain, the, they were, these were like large 12 by 12 uh, see-through uh, clear bases and then large ruins on top of them. In order to see into those ruins, you pretty much had to be in your own half of the board uh, if not, you know, closer to their deployment zone. So in firing angles were very limited here. And so um, having played a lot of matchups on it, especially in the Art of War War Room, um, I realized that I could not take a predominantly shooting army to this event and do well. If I stuck to, hey, Admech shoots really hard, I'm just going to take the best Admech shooting units like Iron Striders, like Big Bricks of Skatari, and just sit there you know, on my half of the board and just shoot my opponent away, that was never going to work on this terrain format. So I had to come up with something different. I also had to anticipate the meta. What, what kinds of armies are going to be actually good on this terrain? Well, because there are these four large ruins where you can't really get angles to shoot into them, it was going to be very powerful for melee armies, especially melee armies that had access to advance and charge or ways to double move. Um, just speed melee armies. They had 12-inch move, Blood Angels with a 14-inch move with the banner. Anything that could move from ruin to ruin and contest your objectives while killing stuff at the same time is going to be extremely dangerous. So I had to not only realize that shooting was going to be hampered, but also that these very fast melee armies with tricks were going to probably be the scariest armies to face. So I came up with an admec list that actually not only repeated those tricks of these other armies, but had tools to counter them. Uh, so Metallica was my choice here. I could have gone with Ryza, which is another forge world that's based around Melee, uh, plus one to wound, plus one to charges. Very nice buffs. I went with Metallica instead because um, it has a lot of really powerful defensive tools, including one CP to turn off all rerolls for a unit within six inches. So think of like Vanguard vets being missed across the table with White Scars, advance and charge. Uh, cool. They come into my uh, non infiltrator units, which already turn off rerolls. I spend this one CP, turn off their rerolls, and now they're probably not doing the damage they expect. You know, things like Repentia or anything that's being buffed by Morvan Vol, um, stuff, anything uh, of that nature, I'm going to be able to limit the amount of damage that it's going to do. And with my units surviving, I have a lot of ways to buff them up, even if there's only a couple models left. So I was very confident that those defensive tools were going to be powerful. Uh, on top of that, Metallica has a really cool strat, uh, one CP called Deafening Assault. Um, you select a unit you, uh, to shoot. And then you pick any unit within 12 inches. doesn't have to be the one that you're targeting, and you don't need line of sight. 
So you could shoot something in the middle of the table that's on the middle objective and then target something that's behind a ruin and you turn off overwatch and set to defend as well as you have their movement. So this stratagem could actually, you could go ahead, kill one of the units that was going to be missiled at you and then limit the second unit that could have been sent at you and just delay the amount of uh, resources that your opponent has that could get into your line. So I felt like Metallica, not only with the veteran cohort and access to advance and charge plus one attack in multiple ways, um, would be able to fight these melee armies because at the end of the day, I'm relatively MSU. I have a ton of different units all over the board that I can trade uh, very efficiently into my opponent, kind of like uh, very similar to Dark Elder. But at the same time, I have these defensive mechanics that give me an advantage in uh, other against other armies that want to try and do the same thing on these boards. So that's why I went with Metallica and the Skatari veteran cohort, and uh, it played beautifully. Oof. Yeah, um, I've uh, <laughs> I watched it happen in action. Uh, you know, I'll spoil it a little bit and say that I, I have played against this at least once, and it was it it was a uh, quite a spectacle, quite a spectacle to watch it happen. Um, yeah, I mean, I I love the premise in general. I know you know right when uh, when you know all the veteran cohort stuff came out, we I know you know you and I had our conversations about okay, what about Sakarans? And you know, you're obviously the one who put it all together and got you know got the final list to where it is, which obviously was good enough to win you a major. But man, there is an impressive amount of rules that you can just kind of do anything with, honestly. Yeah, um, I stacked so many buffs on different units. So uh, going into the event, uh, because my command phase was so extensive with you know a, a wide variety of different buffs on multiple units, I actually had a, you know my friend Jack Harpster and fellow Art of War coach print out some cards for me to help. Um, so... At the baseline, I had the Games Workshop cards, so I could put out the canicles if I wanted to put any uh, buffs on my two Mechanicum characters. And then I had the um, the Skatari protocols. And then on top of that, I had the Canic Thrall Net to be able to throw a second protocol on a unit. And that baseline to keep track of that was already a lot. But then you have every other, the Holy Order command phase buffs, Broad Spectrum Data Tether, um, and, you know, etc. So... You know, galvanic fields above the shooting of my ranger bricks so um i ended up having to have a card system to make sure that i kept track of everything that needed to go out each turn and who had those buffs throughout the turn because uh because uh, the protocols are done at the start of the phase you have to you'll you'll kind of be setting up um what buffs every unit is getting at the start of the battle round then in your command phase you add further things on like the control edict to prevent uh units from uh um, suffering from the depreciation of the protocols. So there's so much planning in this ADMEC list that um, this is not a list... I know, John, you had kind of briefly considered thinking about running ADMEC, um, but the especially at LSO, but the sheer density of the rules compounded on top of each other, it does really require reps. You can't just walk into an event and just easily take the top spot with a, with a list like this. You actually do need some reps um, to be able to master the efficiency and the, the different buffs that you're trying to stack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I honestly, um, I love that. Uh, all right, obviously, we know that Admech is good. That's not going to be shocking yeah. to anyone. I love that this is a very different style Admech list than uh, what we've had on this podcast before and what we've seen winning winning events before. Um, what would you say, comparing this to the traditional Lucius Mars, um, you know, what really sets us apart? What makes this so good? Like, what what's the, the single element that takes this above the other play styles of Admech and makes this what you thought was the best thing for the event? I think it's the, the the complete cohesive set of rules that you're drawing from. So I had mentioned a couple of them. Let me just talk about the Metallica trait, which is very powerful. You, When you fire assault weapons, you ignore the assault the penalty for advancing and shooting them. When you fire heavy weapons, you ignore the heavy penalty for, um, for moving and shooting heavy weapons. So baseline, all my Severus Raiders, the Vanguard, and the Rangers, they're not taking any penalties unless my opponent's in dense cover or has uh, different rules that would give me minuses to hit. So that just straight up was awesome. And then on top of that, if you're in engagement range of me and you fail leadership test, you count as under half strength. And then Metallica has a specific strat from the Book of Rust um, that when your opponent takes a leadership test and, and fails it, um, ones, twos, and threes fail. You subtract one from their combat attrition tests, which because of the Metallica trait means ones, twos, and threes fails. And uh, this is a very powerful tool to have against a lot of armies uh, that don't want to be taking morale on their elite units. So uh, that was that was a very nice tool that uh, Metallica had an edge on. Um, but then let's talk about some of the cool things in the, the Book of Rust, uh, which was a Metallica supplement in there. 
So they got access to some really powerful Warlord traits, relics, and then a set of stratagems that are specific to Metallica. So um, uh, in terms of the Warlord traits, Ash Runner and the combination with Metallic and Lung. So Ash Runner is that Warlord trait plus three inch move. So now that character, uh, in this case, it was the Techno Archaeologist because he was less important than my, uh, than my Manipulus. I'd rather the Techno Archaeologist be the person sent out. Um, he also has a, a things cannot come within uh, 12 inches of him from reserves. So sending him out is, could have a double effect of pushing back reserves and also getting the Metallic and Lung in position. And that was that three inch aura of uh, reroll wounds, which works in both shooting and combat. And boy, did it really help against uh, custodian telemons. Um, so why was this so powerful? Well, Metallica also have a one CP strat called March to War, which allows you to flat advance six. So now this character moves nine inches, flat advances six, 15 inches, and has a three inch aura. So 18 inches. And if you look at the Games Workshop boards, the distance between these ruins wasn't that large. So you could very easily send this character across the board and at the same time have a Rust Docker unit uh, move eight inches or with the Canic Thrall net, or if you're in the protocol, plus three inches, so now moving 11, and then reroll charges. And so you could hit something with both a Metallic and Lung and a Rust Docker unit and make sure that it was, that it was dead. And uh, people, a lot of people noticed that I didn't run a lot of anti-tank in this list to take down tougher targets. This was the combination that I was relying on to help against the tougher targets, uh, the reroll wounds plus the volume of attacks that these uh, melee units, especially the Rust Stalkers, put out. So really like that access, the threat range of this meant that anytime my opponent wanted to come into the center, even with durable characters like Morvan Vol, the potential of these Rust Stalkers plus reroll wounds, it was going to do enough. Um, and that even these durable things like Telemons were going to go down in a single phase. So I really like that combination. And March to War, oh my, my, my gosh, what a stratagem. Uh, one CP, flat advance six, it was so powerful in the threat of it. So a lot of this list was about projecting threat, especially my melee threat, across the board, but also potential obsec plays where it's only one CP to advance and charge with a veteran cohort if it's a Skatari Vanguard or Ranger unit. And because you can flat advance six, you could very easily set up plays where you're contesting. Um, you, you know, you whittle down a unit, char charge the rangers in, they're not going to die in return, but they use that charge distance to get on opponent's objectives, deny primary for very cheap. So the threat range of your denial of primary, but also if you're sending rust stalkers in, um, the threat range of them is they move 11 inches um, because of the plus three inch move from the Canic Thrall net, uh, turn after turn, whenever you need it. Flat advance six. 17 inches, and then I had Eyes of the Omnissiah to reroll charges, so they have very consistent 20 to 24 inch uh, charges, no problem. And uh, once they get in there, they're also doing the same thing. They can be contesting objectives, finishing things off, So, um, and this is all uh, accessed through the advanced charge, which is normally 2 CP, but if you are in the movement protocol, I'd calculate without diversion to reduce its cost to 1 CP. So once per game, it's 1 CP. If it's troops, it's 1 CP. And... Um, that stratagem is also a strategic ploy stratagem, and I have the Holy Order uh, Lajai trait to reduce strategic ploy uh, stratagems by 1 CP as well. So this, uh, this list basically started with 6 CP, except for the fact that I was going to make two of the veteran cohort strats cost less, minimum. Um, I usually didn't use the plus one to wound in shooting, um, and the five of Fiona Pain was a little rare, but sometimes used to try and keep units alive. But baseline, I was going to get ba ba two CP back, and then the Holy Order traits are going to reduce a CP cost, a stratagem cost by one each. So I almost I started with 10 CP, and I was going to game five throughout the game, uh, just at the start of my command phase. So you were looking at actually starting with 15 command points, or being able to use 15 command points throughout the game with this list, which was plenty. And I was very happy with the pre-game expenditures uh, that I took here. But uh, that's kind of the synopsis. This is very much an MSU melee army that projects threat across the board, um, you know, just thinking about it, I also have these Taraxi in here, which can do the same exact thing. They can disembark three inches if they start in the transport, and it was ruled before the event that um, Taraxi could use booster thrust after coming out of transport that turn. Uh, they just couldn't use it if they came in from reserve. So I could disembark them three inches if the plus three inch move was active. They're, dis they're um, then going to be moving 15 inches. I could flat advance them six. They have assault flamers, so they could fire and then I could spend one CP to booster thrust them up, or I could charge them first, um, having spent advance and charge if needed, and uh, they get plus one attack on the charge so they can do tons of damage, then booster thrust one CP back into reserve. There's so many combinations in this army 
that my opponents were constantly racking their brain around which, which threat was going to hit them and what was the scariest thing. And um, just baseline, having access to advance and charge in the flat six advance meant people had to play more defensive in the early game against me, which allowed me to get a points lead uh, early in the game. And ad this admic list doesn't really give up leads in the late game. It kind of just suffocates the opponent and scores the points, and there is no opportunity to come back. And that was very typical in the games I played. Yeah, speaking from experience, you know, especially, you know, my game into you, um, the threat of what every unit could do if you allocated resources into, resources into it definitely kept me conservative in my movement, where normally I like to be the one dictating threat ranges, but when any one of your units on any side of the board could end up going 17 inches and then charging me with a reroll, it's like, ooh, now I don't really want to be this close, and also I need to screen on my characters while also, you know, protecting my screens from Taraxi because I won't be able to interact back with them. Yep. There was a ton of stuff going on, and sometimes, you know, arms with a ton of stuff going on is hard to play with, but it's also very hard to play against because you don't have to actually use it. Nope. You know, a lot of those tricks you never actually ended up using or didn't have to use because I was putting in all of the work of not letting you use them to its full effect, and then you just kind of got to be like, okay, well, I'll still have this next turn. Let's keep going. Exactly, exactly. It was just layers on layers. I had the three Rust Docker units, the big unit of infiltrators, uh, plus the two small units, plus the Taraxi. The big ranger unit, if I needed to use it, could aggressively deny primary points because of its OPSEC nature. So uh, this list was based around um, being able to trade a lot of my resources in turns two, three, four, and ensure that I had the points lead by turn five, that it didn't matter what I had left. Now in practice, I was able to trade so efficiently that I often had a lot of stuff left. But, um, you know, it, it, if I needed to trade down, I could have, actually, with the amount of resources I had. All right. All right. I like well, it. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's move on over towards more of the uh, intangible stuff, like the, uh, the mission. Uh, usually, we've seen the best or the most successful ninth edition list. They usually have kind of a, uh, almost like a table of about five or so secondaries that they really want to pick uh, when they're on their plan A and things are going their way. They can affect the game state how they want to affect it. And then usually a couple more from like almost like secondaries or alternatives when they don't get to play uh, the game they want to play and the opponent mm -hmm. doesn't let them play how they want to play. And it's almost like plan B secondaries. Um, some of the listeners might have noticed that you you do have a single vehicle in here. This is not a vehicle list list. And I think mm -hmm. that kind of leads into one of your secondaries. And you can let me know if I'm, uh, if I'm correct here. Why don't you, you talk correct. through your uh, secondary plan? <laughs> So uh, the secondary you're referring to is Eradication of the Flesh. When the AdMech book actually came out, I saw a lot of reviews saying that AdMech did not get good secondaries. And boy, I disagree with that hard. Um, eradication of the Flesh, which is in the second category, no mercy, no respite. Uh, so it's competing with Grind Them Down, no prisoners, and uh, to the last, is an amazing secondary because of the meta right now. The meta is very infantry MSU heavy. And the secondary is... If you kill more infantry units of your opponents in the battle round than they kill of your vehicle units, and you have to have a minimum of one vehicle on the battlefield uh, to, in order to score this, you get three points. So three points a turn if I kill one infantry unit and my opponent doesn't kill my Dune Rider is essentially what this secondary is. And I took it in most games. It's an amazing secondary against armies um, like Sisters of Battle, which have a lot of cheap five infantry units. Um, it's amazing against armies like Jukari, which also have a uh, very MSU infantry heavy based army that any single one of my units is going to pick up one of theirs. And um, even though both armies have a lot of tricks with, you know, multi meltos coming out of Rhinos, pregame move, uh, Jukari Raiders being able to uh, get up the field very quickly and get angles. Um, still, in those matchups and because of this terrain, I was able to take the single Dune Rider and guarantee that I was going to look at uh, 12, if not 15 points on that secondary. Sometimes turn one, you wouldn't get it, and I was perfectly fine with that because it's essentially competing with uh, Retrieve Octarius data for me, which is a 12-point secondary uh, based on how I've designed this list, which I'll talk about in just a second. But uh, if I get 12 points on it, perfectly fine, but it always had the opportunity to get me 15 in most matchups. Um, so what other secondaries did I build around? Stranglehold. I could do engage on all fronts, but generally this list likes just playing the mission. It wants to deny primary at the same time as trying to make it as difficult for my opponent as possible to take down my primary score. So um, Stranglehold was automatic. I took it in every single game without fail and uh, did very well on it. And uh, all you have to do, touch three of the objectives and control more than your opponent. 
And um, so on odd objective missions, it was very easy shoot your opponent off one objective or fight them off one and then hold, uh, hold the, other, the other ones. And uh, that secondary worked brilliantly, almost always maxed it. Uh, the second one that I would take uh, typically was Eradication of the Flesh. And then the third one uh, was a toss-up. Uh, Retrieve Octarius was very typical. Um, I don't like raised banners very often unless my opponent doesn't have speed. This happened round one when I played against Ultramarine List that didn't really have the tools to get across the board very quickly. And um, I ended up taking banners there, was able to raise uh, four on turn one on Surround, surround and Destroy, uh, thanks to the Infiltrators, and then just let them, let them score points turn after turn. But I typically chose, uh, in the tougher matchups against armies with speed, uh, Retrieve Octarius data, this list has a lot of ways to score it. Not only is there MSU um, infantry bodies on both sides of my deployment zone, but in addition to that, I have ways to get back into reserve. So the Traxi with booster thrust going back into reserve, they could potentially do it. But also one CP circuitous assassins on any of the Sakaran units, they could go into reserve at the end of the movement phase and then come down the following turn and be able to get it very easily. Uh, I would typically do this on you know the Sakaran units that were either my opponent tried to trap in combat or the ones uh, that were just whittled down. I could send that up and it'd be much harder for my opponent to screen that out. So um, on top of that, um, I could also set up late game plays where taking care of the anti-tank and the big threats, I could push uh, five-man infantry squads into the Dune Rider, move advance it up on the side of the board, and then potentially disembark those into the quarter that I need uh, in the late game. So multiple ways to get retrieve Octarius data, but banners wasn't a terrible choice if my opponent didn't have speed. And then, um, other options beside that, if my opponent gave up a kill secondary, I probably still didn't take it, um, just because I'm very nervous of, play, of players playing conservative in the first like early turns, and then keeping those resources alive while trading their other stuff on the mission. So I typically don't like taking things like assassinate or bring it down. Instead, I like things that in interact with the mission and the primary points uh, and, and the board state. So I uh, designed it around those, those particular secondaries. But um, throughout the course of the Games Workshop Orlando tournament, we played several missions that had, um, for my list, very easy uh, secondary choices. So Sweeping Clear was played twice, and Direct Assault is just three points for Touch in the Middle. I took that both times. Priority Targets was played as well. I took that um, uh, on that mission. And um, I also um, could have taken Data Intercept on, direct, on uh, Vital Intelligence. Didn't end up needing to do it. But uh, against a harder opponent, I certainly would have taken it there. So a lot of options if the, uh, the mission secondary related to just holding down primary points and holding the objectives. I felt very com comfortable uh, taking those. All right. Awesome. Yeah, we, uh, John, did you have any more questions? I wanted to move on to a little bit to uh, his CP plan. He kind of mentioned it a little bit before. Nope. That's exactly where I was going. All right. Yeah, why don't you talk us through that? I know you kind of have a roundabout CP regeneration. You talked a little bit about uh, discounting where usually most armies either kind of have their set CP, this is what you get, or they try to regenerate CP with warlord traits or spells or relics. Uh, so why don't you talk to us about that? And talk to us about your typical CP budget, like your set in stone, your discretionary, and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. So uh, command points is a big part of Admec. Admec, uh, especially this Metallica build, has just such a large suite of, of very powerful 1 CP stratagems to take advantage of that I needed to uh, always have in mind that I could potentially need these stratagems in the late game, so I'd be very careful spending early game. Even though I ran a single battalion, I started with only 6 CP um, in each game, but like I said, there were minimum 4 ways for me to reduce CP costs, so I essentially started with 10, thanks to the combination of Calculate Without Diversion, uh, the uh, Veteran Cohort uh, Warlord trait, and then the two Holy Order traits. Now, those can only be used on particular stratagems, and the, the Veteran Cohort Warlord trait only works when you're in a particular protocol for your army, but... Um, at those times, I would spend them as early as possible just to make sure late game I had a guaranteed set of uh, command points. Now, what stratagems did I prioritize using? I knew very likely I would use booster thrust um, in, in once per game, pretty much. I'd send this whatever whatever turn I wanted to send out the Taraxi and project their threat, and I'd primarily be doing it on a turn where I knew the following turn um, when I when they would come down out of reserve. And my opponent was going to start running low on screens, or they were running low on firepower to deal with the Traxi. And so I never, I didn't have to do it turn one. I did it a couple of times turn one, but predominantly I did it turns two or three. 
uh, when my opponent started running low on screens, or if they had to screen their backfield with their extra units, with these extra units, that uh, I would end up taking uh, complete control of the board in, in the late game, in the, of the middle of the board. So I was going to spend booster thrust. Um, Galvanic Volley Fire, which is a very powerful stratagem, uh, it was changed. So instead of working um, and changing the Galvanic Rifles to a Rapid Fire, instead in the FAQ update, it's still 2 CP, doesn't change based on the squad size, but it changes the weapons from Heavy 2 to Heavy 3. And this is very powerful in Metallica because I ignore the Heavy penalty on the Rangers when they move and shoot. So I can just get 60 shots for 2 CP, and that seems like a great amount of value. But I very, very rarely use this strat throughout. Most of my buffs were on the uh, melee infantry, and it was a trap to spend these 2 CP on Galvanic Field uh, based on the terrain because, uh, because the firing angles were so limited at Games Workshop Orlando. You were only really shooting the stuff that your opponent wanted you to shoot, and typically they were fine with trading those pieces. It wasn't like I didn't play too many matchups against very durable stuff, but when I did play against Custodes, I actually did use uh, Galvanic Volley Fire. So that was the time that it came up against really tough targets that I wanted to whittle down as a, um, to guarantee that my melee units would finish them off. I thought about using Galvanic Volley Fire. Uh, other stratagems that I typically used is the plus one attack. Now there's a one CP strat for Sakarans, so either Infiltrators or Rust Dockers can use it. Pretty much use that at least once uh, every single matchup. Uh, and then there's the Skatari Veteran Cohort stratagem for one CP to give plus one attack to any unit. I, I use that one every single game because I had the Warlord trait to reduce its CP cost by one when I was in the melee, the aggressive protocol. So guaranteed, always use that. Uh, the 5 of Fiona Pain, I also use that semi-frequently. I use it against John. Um, I used it again in matchups where I wanted my opponent to have to commit a lot of shooting to finish a unit off. And by baiting all that shooting out, I could take, I could take advantage of it by either killing it, um, tying it up, etc. Uh, just getting it away from transports. So um, I typically you would use it on the big Severus Raiders unit. I would pop plus one armor save early game and then use Calculate Without Diversion to reduce its CP cost from two on a less than 10 power level unit to uh, only costing me one CP. And one CP for five of Fiona Pain on nine um, Severus Raiders, that's amazing value uh, with their, their two wounds. So uh, I would typically use that combination. Um, other ones that I would use is, like I said, Circuitous Assassins anytime that I took the Retrieve Octarius data, I always saved CP late game uh, so that I could do Circuit Assassins. So turn three or four, I'd bring up a Sakaran unit to guarantee I would get the max 12 points on Retrieve Octarius data. Um, some stratagems that I needed to think about using, um, uh, you know, kind of discretionary uses were the one CP for Electroshocked, which is off a Mechanicum character, so either the Techno Archaeologist or the Manipulus. And what this does is you pick a unit with engagement range and it fights last. So between that and the Temper Copia Relic on the big 10-man um, Rustocker unit, I could go into combat with both of those characters, have two ways to make things fight last, and then I could activate first in a totally separate combat and get three units fighting before my, own, my opponent gets to do anything. So that combination was always in my back pocket. I never actually used it throughout the tournament. I never had that combination where I got to fight in three places and uh, a double fight last going somewhere. So, uh, but it, it was something that could have been very powerful and needed to, to win me the game. So I, I wanted that in my back pocket. Um, other things I, I used semi-frequently, but not always, and this may surprise you, is the advance and charge. I actually didn't use the advance and charge too often. Um, it's 2 CP um, unless it's a troop unit. So in the plus three inch movement protocol, I could reduce it to one CP uh, for a non-troop unit, but I very rarely actually used advance and charge. I only used it a couple times throughout the tournament. Um, same with March to War, which is the flat six advance. It was mostly the threat of those things. My opponents actually played conservative enough where I didn't actually have to spend those resources, uh, even though I, I was happy to do so. The list is designed to be able to send those missiles out, but I actually didn't have to use that combination very often. Um, I would typically use the 1 CP flat 6 advance in order to get obsec on an objective or to get the Severus Raiders around a corner to be able to pick something off. That was actually the most typical thing I would use it for. Um, or getting the Taraxi to touch the center of the board and then uh, be able to flame something away and then go up. Uh, those are the most typical combos I used with the uh, March to War stratagem. Other ones that I used was 1 CP turn off rerolls, uh, Blaring Glory from the Book of Rust. Um, I didn't end up playing against um, very many um, units that had full rerolls 
But anytime it came up, and Mr. Tim, it came up against you, um, where I wanted to really cripple the offensive efficiency of something like Repentia being buffed by Morvan Vol, go ahead and spend this. And if the units survive, it's actually a huge swing, uh, especially when they give an obsec by the Dogmata. So I used it a couple times, but all, once again, it was the threat of it, like against Jack Harpster's Blood Angels. He's got Dante there uh, giving out the Chapter Master buff on, uh, say, a unit of Death Company that's minus one to hit from the Hammers. Being able to turn off their rerolls to hit is, is pretty powerful and dramatically reduces the efficiency of the units. So when I when they were not when uh, charges were being made into my non-infiltrator units, I had this in my back pocket to use as a defensive tool to just limit the damage I would take in. So maybe I'd only lose like three or four Rust Stalkers instead of you know most of a unit. Um, that was kind of those trades were something I was willing to uh, spend CP on because it could result in a huge swing on primary, just having extra resources thrown into the middle of the table. John smiling. Uh, I'm smiling because uh, I think you need to start wearing cargo pants to tournaments because you must have the deepest pockets in the 41st millennium for all of these tricks. <laughs> I've got a whole bag of strategy. And then once again, I, like I mentioned, deafening assault is such a good one. I never used that strategy a single time, but once again, it was the threat of it, being able to shoot something with Severus Raiders, which are just in the middle of the table, and then pick something out of line of sight to reduce its movement, uh, have its movement. Uh, super powerful or turn off Overwatch. I could have used it, but I ended up um, not having an amazing chance. But uh, if if it was like a late game situation where my opponent was really running low on resources, really only had two potential missiles to throw at me, and I was about to deal with one of them, this would be the situation to cripple the other one by having its movement. So once again, this is why Metallica has so many really cool tools. They also have um, Exaltation of the Omnissiah, uh, like I mentioned before, to mess with morale. So anytime my opponent was going to take a scary morale test on some elite infantry, or, uh, for instance, Will Taylor took one on a 10 Witch Squad that had lost four models. I went ahead and spent Exaltation of the Omnissiah, now failing uh, um, combat attrition on ones, twos, and threes. It crippled the unit. Only one model was left. A lot of threes were rolled around John. <laughs> <laughs> of course they were. So, uh, it's just a whole bag of tricks. It's the resources all over the place. I typically, like I said, I focused on those first couple strats. Any stratagems that helped me win the mission, I focused on. And then anything that was damaged or tricksy uh, that could help keep things alive, that was the second layer of stratagems that I would save CP for. All right, so it's a wonderful segue, but uh, focus on things that score you points and then worry about killing second. Yep. But you had enough CP to do both in most games. Yeah, I did. <laughs> All right. So uh, a wonderful segue indeed, because the next thing I want to talk about is the primary. Um, now, you've got a lot of stuff in the list, and you have yep. a lot of obsects, so mm -hmm. I can... You know, again, from experience, I can see how it uh, influences the opponent's primary. How do you uh, how do you best score your own primary? A lot of this stuff is durable to a point, but isn't actually durable. It's a lot of T three bodies. They have four up armor save. Could go to three up in the, the particular protocol. Most of the units in the list have the five up invul, which is very powerful. Enhanced bionics means that uh, you know five up invuls can get a little swingy. Um, so. They have that kind of defensive mechanic, and once again, turning off rerolls is also very powerful. But at the end of the day, it was the positioning on objectives that mattered the most for me. And like John mentioned, I have several, I have a lot of units. What you can do on objectives, especially against melee armies and on terrain like this, where the first floor completely blocked line of sight, so your opponent couldn't shoot the front layer and then charge the back layer, you could put it so that a melee army that was trying to charge into the ruin could only charge the front unit, make a nice U-shape where if they wanted to go for the long charge for the unit behind, they either wouldn't have enough inches or it'd be such a long charge that it was a massive risk. And if they fail the charge there, they could potentially just uh, lose a really key resource for no reason. So um, I ended up doing that type of positioning on objectives consistently turn after turn after turn because it ended up that a lot of objectives were semi in those ruins or even completely in the ruins uh, on those uh, 12 by 12 clear bases, uh, which was allowed at the tournament. So uh, I was very able, easily able to create layers of models where my opponent, if they wanted to charge into the ruin, would not charge uh, and kill the obsec. Typically I had infiltrators up front because they natively turn off rerolls, so I didn't have to really spend defensive buffs on them. And then behind I'd have the five-man vanguard or five-man rangers, uh, maybe some rust stalkers around too. And I would try and load up on each side equally so I'd have enough resources that if my opponent overcommitted to one flank, I could slowly readjust my resources, especially the 10 man, uh, the, the 19 man ranger brick uh, to the other side. But predominantly that I started with enough models that I could keep the same um, kind of consistency on each side of preventing having 
If my opponent comes in and kills the five models on the objective, I then have another five to go up in front and protect my obsec turn after turn after turn. And this ended up playing out uh, brilliantly in most games, uh, where anytime my opponent tried to trade on objectives, it was it was a risk for them each time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So obviously, you know, this army sounds like it's designed to really, you know, take advantage of this terrain format. It can, you know, hold objectives super super well there. Yep. Um, did you find that in any of the missions, the objectives were just in the open? I yeah. I think at least one game, oh, yeah. there was one where they were just all in the it's open. It's called Battle Lines, John, and I happened to play against Custodes on that game. And uh, Custodes went first and put everything onto the objectives, and that was the, one of the hardest games that I played at the tournament. So I had to be very, very careful in uh, how I dealt with the heroic interventions in there and also just the really durable obsec. So that was a very tricksy game. And because the objectives were out in the open, I was able to shoot at what I wanted to on the objectives. But engaging it in melee uh, required a lot of uh, combat tricks and, and being able to tie certain things up and prevent heroics um, mm -hmm. by uh, various means. Yeah. How were you able to score your own primary in that mission? Uh, I scored it in the late game because it was very difficult to score in the early game because I couldn't get my models on the objective. What I typically do when I go first is I send a unit of Severus Raiders out. Uh, if my opponent takes Stranglehold or it was a mission like Battle Lines, I could have just go, gone ahead and um, put the Severus Raiders touching the edge of the objective and circling all around it, make sure my opponent can't jump behind me and trap them, so that I could spend the 2 CP tactic, oh, tactic Oblique, a stratagem, to when the Severus Raiders are declared as a charge target, they move, make a normal move, which is 12 inches uh, in any direction. And because of that, I could go ahead, move block the objective, now, if they want to charge, they can't walk onto the objective because I'm blocking it. If they want to charge onto the objective, I then spend the 2 CP, move away, they fail the charge, and now can't get on the objective. So they don't get any primary on it. I don't have to kill that unit if I don't want to. And um, this is super amazing uh, play for denying stranglehold points or on sweep and clear direct assault. So that was a play that if I went first, I would start by trying to die secondaries like that. And if they don't go for the charge play, they don't put something out there that could potentially charge, um, I could just get a 15 on primary, potentially. So um, that was the typical move that I like to set up the first two turns, is what I use both Severus Raider bricks for. Uh, I typically send out the 7-man first to try and expose extra resources, then use the 9-man in, in the second turn to do that. And that, that strategy worked brilliantly. I think Severus Raiders are absolutely crucial for Admech gaining an advantage on primary in the early game and also forcing the opponent to expend extra resources than they otherwise would have. Tactical Oblica, even though it got nerfed from its 8th edition version, is still absolutely crucial to how Admet can outplay people on the mission, and I did that in most games. Yeah, Ooh, that was a nice thorough answer. I did have one last question I wanted to ask before we uh, wrap up this episode, mm -hmm. and that is, we talked a lot about the GW train format. Yes. Now... It, it, I actually really enjoyed the DW train format, but not every event is going to be like that. Yeah. How do you think your army would function on something like the train we saw at ACO or Lone Star? Do you think your army yeah. would work just as well? Would you make any tweaks with uh, the train format in mind? I think it would work brilliantly on the uh, LSO train that you played on with your sisters with mm -hmm. the player place train. I think because you get to place the train in your half of the board that I could set up those missile points projecting threat from this army and also create angles where my opponent doesn't uh, really have a lot of firing uh, lanes into that terrain feature. So I think it can work very well there. Um, I think on the ACO terrain where you know the terrain was all over the place, some of the stuff in the, the bottom you know, you know, 100 tables or so wasn't very heavy, I think that would be a lot harder. And that's where I would consider adding extra shooting in or just switching to Lucius and Mars, which I had done a lot of stream games with. Um, and I like that if your primary goal is to shoot, I really love the combination of Lucius and Mars. But uh, if you're trying to win um, on heavier terrain, I think armies like Metallica are better suited to it. So terrain definitely played a big role in why I took this army. Being able to, like I said, project threat from ruin to ruin and force opponents to deploy more conservatively, even though you couldn't shoot them, that was massive for my Admech army and getting an advantage in most matchups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree on that. Honestly, I I was much more worried about the the Sakaran heavy build that you were uh, that you were painting up next to me. Oh, I, was, uh, <laughs> I was trying. It took me a while to paint all this. I, I believe it. Um, I was more worried about that than I was the the traditional uh, Lucius and Mars going into that GW event. Yeah, and uh, woof, for a reason. For a reason. Talk yeah. about an intimidating list. Well, you saw it. There were there was one or two other Admech lists in the top sixteen. Uh, I think there was one other, and I think uh, 
I, it wasn't Metallica, but it still had a relatively heavy presence of Sicarans. Yeah. I think uh, it had like four last chickens and like 30 something Sicarans, whereas I think your list ended up over 40. Yeah. So, um, Admeg didn't do amazingly well. They weren't dominating the top 16 in this tournament, but the lists that were tailored to do so, like mine, mm -hmm. uh, actually played the mission brilliantly um, on the GW terrain. So, this just goes to show you how powerful it is getting practice beforehand on the big terrain formats. Uh, actually getting reps in, seeing what you need, what tweaks you need to make to your list, and then uh, actually executing it um, at the tournament itself. So, I mean, you could see it with you, myself, Jack, and Mark all making uh, the the, uh, the semis. Um, we we all practice various lists on the terrain format, and we're able to take advantage of that at the actual event. So, absolutely massive to to do practice games beforehand and really master terrain formats. It does matter. There are there is tailoring you can do to help you on different terrain formats. All right. Well, uh, that I don't really have any questions. I thought that was a uh, a very thorough breakdown of uh, the premise of your list and the vacuum and how it worked, and then some really good touches on uh, on terrain. I think now, as we are a year into ninth edition, we're going to start really seeing these um, almost these uh, terrain formats start to gel. As we have player place terrain from Frontline Gaming, uh, we have WTC terrain, which is very dense. We now have uh, GW's. Uh, first event in a long time where they've, you know, very high publicity has said, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And it's very cleanly detailed laid out. And a lot of stores um, have tons of GW terrain sitting around. And if they don't, they can either add the bases to the plexiglass, not permanently, or some of them, they actually have gone and based it. And this is kind of a nice way to make it work. So I think now it's just going to be the smaller events, seeing if they catch up and kind of follow the lead of one of these. Um, normally this is where I would ask the, uh, the guest if they want to plug anything, but, uh, Richard, I don't know if we mentioned this, um, you are actually a coach on the Art of War 40k, uh, and I'm about to plug you here in a second, but is there anything uh, else you would like to, uh, plug or say before I do that? Yeah, I mean, I want to thank my teammates, uh, John, obviously, I got, uh, Mr. Jack Harpster who helped me practice the week before. Um, if you were a member of the War Room, you were able to see all the practice matches we did. We did actually my Metallica build versus his Blood Angels, which happened to be a semifinal matchup. Um, but uh, Nick Nanavati as well for helping me practice, uh, and Mark Perry. So all of us had collectively been working on builds for a while and wanted to really master it. I wrote uh, you know, a very um, crazy Aldari soup list that Mark really liked, and we started working on that and testing it out. So um, this just goes to show you how bringing together a group of friends and community members, uh, you know, your local teammates together and just creating a team environment is super helpful for testing ideas and getting it together. And this is really what the War Room is about. It's creating a community where you can test the most competitive ideas and, and build the most interesting lists that fit your play style. And um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can join us there. All right. Well, uh... That's a pretty good segue. Uh, everyone, thanks for joining us on the uh, Art of War 40K podcast. If you are not a subscriber and you liked what you heard, you can go over to the Art of War 40K.com, sign up over there, gain access to part two of this episode where we dive into faction matchups. And also while you're there, you can sign up to gain access to the War Room where coaches like John, Richard, and then some of the other coaches that, uh, that Richard just mentioned break down every faction with week clinics, strategy sessions, math clinics, and stream games. Uh, including uh, subscriber requests uh, from Nurgle Matt and anyone else who uh, decided to put up the uh, big <laughs> donations. Until then, I'm Tim. And I'm John. And we'll see you next time. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under and Art of War Unbroken on the competitive 40K network. Theartofwar40k.com. 